clock on the wall isn't correct and it is two o'clock and we've had to set up more chairs, which is wonderful. We welcome you all today. Last winter sometime, Rosalie came to one of our Voices from the Past programs and afterwards we were visiting and she said, uh, I have something that I would like to share with you and we were thrilled to be able to have Rosalie Lippicott come today and tell us about her experiences with the North Platte Canteen. This is such a nice crowd, and I've been guaranteed that you're all on my side, and I shouldn't be nervous, so I'm not going to be. Uh, just to start off with, is there anybody that doesn't know what the North Platte Canteen was? Is there anybody who was, uh, that was a veteran that was at the North Platte Canteen? Oh, we have one, good for you. <laughs> or any, <laughs> or anybody who like I was a volunteer that was at the canteen? Virginia. <laughs> A good old Shelton Bulldog back there. <laughs> okay. Before, oh, okay. Your mother? Oh, wow, that's wonderful. Before World War II, North Platte was known as the place where you changed the hands of your watch, either forwards or backwards, depending on the uh, direction of travel. Then came December 1941 and the attack on Pearl Harbor. And Americans felt at great risk and patriotism just emerged. Thus began the remarkable story of the North Platte Canteen and of the volunteer service there. The name and fame of North Platte would travel around the world because the men and the women of the armed forces spread the word of the generosity that they had experienced there. The population of the United States at that time stood at about 16 million, and soon six million were in the armed forces. During the war, the military from every walk of life in every part of the United States rolled into North Platte on troop trains en route to the ultimate destinations, either in Europe or the Pacific. Trains were the major mode of transporting the troops, and North Platte, population 12,500, was the stopping place for all those trains because they had to take on coal, water, or change crews, and there they did that at North Platte. There was a 25-year-old gal, her name was Ray Wilson, who had a brother who was a member of the Nebraska National Guard, and a few days after Pearl Harbor, she had word that her brother's company would be passing through North Platte. And so it was her idea to meet that train with goodies. She gathered up and passed word to her friends, and a group of them met that train. Well, lo and behold, wouldn't you know it? You know, it was a true uh, a group from Kansas, not Nebraska, and her brothers and friends were not there. 
what to do with all those goodies. Well, of course, you know what they did. They handed them out to those Kansas men. And the fellows were so surprised and so happy. Well, Ray went home with the idea, we made those men so happy, why couldn't we do that with other uh, troops going through the town? So she sat down and she wrote a letter to the uh, North Platte paper and a public meeting was called in a few days and of course Ray got elected as a chairman of a committee that would organize a canteen. She knew that at the station there was a vacant lunch room. So she thought, all I have to do is contact the president of the uh, Union Pacific, uh, get the use of that. Um, now that's not W.C. Fields, that is William Jeffers. And that picture of him hung in that North by canteen all those years, but that's him. So anyhow, Mr. Jeffers agreed to the ladies using that um, lunchroom. Not only did he let them use the lunchroom, but over the years, he provided heat, water, cups, napkins, he bought a dishwashing machine for the, uh, the ladies' use. He even supplies Union Pacific employees to do the janitor work. Well, in just a couple of weeks, the plans were all developed and the canteen opened on Christmas Day, 1941. Soon word got around and surrounding communities offered help, food, money. Volunteers gave more than just their time. Do you remember rationing? Tires, gasoline, meat, sugar, butter, shoes, all were rationed to ensure an adequate supply for our troops. But the women found ways to share that sugar, to bake cookies and uh, cakes, and the men willingly supplied the tires that took, made that round trip from here to uh, North Platte. And by the way, I have a rationing book in case you've forgotten what they look like. <laughs> do you folks remember them? <laughs> Some of us do. Um, the canteen operated every day from early morning until the train stopped running late at night for 51 months, never ran out of food. It was a miracle. An average of from three to 5,000 people were fed every day. An average of 18 to 30 trains stopped. From December 1941 to April, 1946, the canteen was housed in that depot. Six million service personnel were provided with food, drink, or a boost to their morale on the way to war or at the way home. A never-ending stream of young, weary, homesick military personnel found a haven that provided the encouragement they needed to get them through the difficult times ahead. The canteen proved to be an outstanding example of endearing gratitude expressed to those in the military. 
No one was turned away. No one paid a cent for what they received. The brief moments spent in the canteen has been remembered and even revered in the minds of men for a lifetime of years. Can't believe it, but it's been almost 70 years. And yet the welcoming hospitality and the love extended to those who came through the doors of the North Platte Canteen is still remembered, even revered. And why? I think probably it was because the Buck Private was welcomed, along with the general and the seaman, stood as an equal with the commander. Service personnel were grateful for on those overcrowded trains that probably was the only really good food they'd had during their trip. An average daily supply of food served at the canteen would have been something like this. 175 loaves of bread, 100 pounds of meat, 45 pounds of coffee, 1,000 pints of milk, 40 quarts of cream, quarts of peanut butter, dozens of hard-boiled eggs. Except for the milk, the coffee, the juice, and the candy bars, all that food was homemade in the kitchens on farms or the little towns. Volunteers, both men and women, made sandwiches, cookies, pies, boiled eggs, baked birthday cakes, fried chickens, butchered beefs, and dressed pheasants. Can you believe that the fried chicken served to these people that came through the canteen, grown on the farms, killed in the wee hours of the morning, plucked, dressed, fried in the kitchens, then toted up to the canteen and served. Could that happen today? I think not with all the government regulations. The little Sand Hill town of Stapleton on one occasion brought um, a basket of fried pheasants, and then they had pheasant feathers to give to everybody. And can you imagine the looks of that with the guys marching out of that depot with those pheasant feathers flying out of their caps? On Thanksgiving Day, home roasted turkey, homemade pumpkin pie. On, um, from, if, in the kitchens or in town or the farms and brought to the canteen. On Christmas Day, the North Platte students did not exchange Christmas gifts. Instead, they brought their gifts to the canteen. The little town of uh, Sutherland one year delivered 900 wrapped Christmas gifts. On Easter, there were Easter baskets to give away, or on May Day, May baskets. Records show that the town of Wellfleet out in the Sand Hills one day brought, and that population, 178 people, they brought one-third of the town to North Platte to volunteer in the canteen. One ranch town butchered a beef, and they um, butchered it, roasted it, ground it, brought it to the canteen and served the whole beef that day. The ladies at Tryon out in the Sand Hills 
you know what they did? They made popcorn balls. And then they put the names of the single girls <laughs> in the popcorn ball and distributed them. And you know, there was one marriage for sure took place from that exchange. And I met the lady who, uh, that, who had married that uh, soldier boy she met. And it was a long, happy marriage. And no, Bob Stubblefield, I want you to know, I never gave my name out to anybody. <laughs> no, I didn't. I had my own boyfriend at home. I didn't need to give my name to anybody. <laughs> And by the way, I married him, and we were married for 63 years. Thank you. An example of the spirit and enthusiasm typical of the community staff, the canteen, was published in the Myrna and Salmo paper, in, and this was in 1944. And now listen to this. It took 22 cars and three pickups to transport the people to the canteen from out there in the hills. They brought with them 53 birthday cakes 127 fried chickens, 58 dozen cookies, 32 dozen cupcakes, 73 pounds of coffee, 163 dozen eggs, 68 dozen donuts, 41 quarts of home canned pickles, three and a half crates of oranges, nine pounds of ham, 160 loaves of bread, 40 popcorn balls, 50 pounds of sandwich meat, four cartons of cigarettes, four decks of cards, and $600 in cash. One little town, one day. Now, I've given you a lot of figures, but I did that only to give you an idea of the scope of the amount of food that it took to feed these people and the generosity of the communities. The canteen was run like a business with monthly meeting of officers and an audit of the expenses. Exact records were not kept except one month and that record showed there were 40,000 cookies, 30,000 hard-boiled eggs, 6,000 donuts, 7,000 cakes, one and a half ton meat. And, um, well, that's the end of that, except that the expenses monthly run from one to $5,000. Those expenses were covered in various ways, but one of the, well, two unique ways, Franklin Roosevelt, the president at the time, Mary, sent $5. <laughs> That's all the federal money that was involved. There was a young teenage boy out in North Platte that regularly uh, visited the public auctions, the livestock barns, and he'd take the shirt off of his back, and they auctioned off that shirt. And over the course of the 51 months, that young boy by himself gave $2,000 to the canteen. Well, as word of the successful venture spread, People in the surrounding communities wanted to be involved. Over the time, 
They estimate 55,000 volunteers came from the 125 communities. Shelton, my hometown, and this town of Grand Island were the farthest east towns that went to the canteen. I was a volunteer with my hometown of Shelton when um, we took our turns going. I was 15 years old when I made my first visit. Our group was organized by the American Legion Auxiliary there in, the, in that little town. And we had a town, uh, we had a lady by the name of Opal in our town. And Opal was in charge of the American Legion. And by Jiminy, we did what Opal told us to do. <laughs> you know, every town has an Opal, don't we? <laughs> During um, those 51 months when it was our turn to go, I went what I could. I was a, a student in high school, and then I was also a teacher in the rural school, so I couldn't always go. But I went when I could. I have a letter dated March 4th, 1945, that I wrote to that guy whose picture you saw and to whom I was engaged to marry at the time and he was in Germany. But I wrote to him about one of those visits and of all the letter exchange that we had, I just happened to save this one letter and I'm so glad I did. But I told him about that visit and how I had gone to town, stayed overnight with my friend Mary. I had two friends in Shelton. I had Virginia was one of my friends and Mary was the other one. <laughs> I stayed with Mary. But anyhow, we were told that if we were at the railroad station at 3.30, a M. We can get a free ride to North Platte on the on the train because we had a pass. The Union Pacific gave us a pass, and so I stayed all night with Mary. But I wrote to Dick that wouldn't you know it, we overslept, and we had six minutes to get that six or eight blocks to the railroad station. But we jumped into our clothes and we ran. And as it happened, the train was late, so we made it in time. <laughs> Anyhow, we, uh, get on this train at 3.35 or whatever it was in the morning. And then got to North Platte at 7 o'clock in the morning. The first thing I was told to do that morning was to sort the books and magazines, and they were to be laid out in a long table made, all lined up nice so they looked attractive for the uh, fellows to pick up. There was Look, Liberty, Saturday Evening Post, the Reader's Digest, the comic books, the sports magazines, the movie magazines, all very popular. There were Bibles and there were postcards and stationery, all there for the guys to pick up. I wrote to Dick that we took a 24 dozen egg case, hard boiled eggs, but they needed to be peeled. And so from 10 o'clock in the morning until one o'clock in the afternoon, I helped make egg salad sandwiches. And I have in the letter that we put those egg salad sandwiches in bushel baskets 
you know, that had probably had peaches or something in it, lined that basket with a clean white dish towel, stacked the uh, sandwiches that were heavy egg salad sandwiches. And by the way, that mayonnaise probably was homemade mayonnaise too that put in this, in that egg salad. How come we didn't poison all those guys? <laughs> <laughs> Today we wouldn't. They would all be, you know, laid up. We gave away 15 birthday cakes that day, for it was a custom for the canteen ladies to ask if there was anybody that had a birthday. And of course, they didn't have to show proof. It was just, yeah, it's my birthday. <laughs> they always got a cake and what big smiles. But from Shelton that day, we took 300 loaves of bread 10 pounds of coffee, lemons for lemonade, bushels of apples, cookies, and cash. Um, <clears throat> it was a great community effort for our little town life with all the other towns. And it certainly was a patriotic activity, something that um, we could do to uh, send those guys on their way. Something we hope we were doing for someone's loved one, what I was hoping somebody would do for my loved one. There would be two or three communities furnishing goods every day. Food again was served from a long L-shaped table, coffee made from the biggest coffee urn that I have, uh, uh, I haven't seen a bigger one since. It was huge. And I think they still have that up there in North Platte. But they'd say, troop train coming in, or somebody would say, put the coffee pot on. And that was the cue for fried chicken, pickles, hard-boiled eggs, cookies, cake, pie, hot coffee, cold milk, and the milk that we lined the table was in these little half-pint bottles, just rows and rows. <laughs> milk like that, and the guys just <laughs> <laughs> A room quickly filled with great excitement, and the troops came rushing in. Food disappeared like magic. Remember, the stop was brief, only 10 or 15 minutes. My letter to Dick continued on. We were very busy serving 18 trains. There were the boys in khaki, boys in navy blue, the air corpsmen, Marines, the dog face, the 90 day wonder, those with ribbons on their chest. Rank had no privilege there from the buck private to the general, we fed them all. They say, how much for the food? What do we owe you? Nothing, it's all free, help yourself. It was wonderful. Music from the old upright piano filled the room. Either a serviceman or a volunteer would have come in on the spot, sing along songs like don't sit under the apple tree, sentimental journey, Chattanooga choo choo, I'll be seeing you. The man would grab a girl and the jitter buggy began. We smiled a lot. It was very exciting. And by the way, the man at the piano it was later identified as Lloyd Sinovac. 
And Lloyd, years later, just happened to find himself back in North Platte. And he li lived there, made a living there. And he married a girl from Shelton, <laughs> a friend of ours, <laughs> Nola Butchcore. Anybody know her? And they still live in uh, North Platte. And Lloyd and Nola, whenever there's any canteen thing going on, they're right there. After a can, 15 minute short stop, the train would whistle all aboard and suddenly the time was up. And there was a rush, a rush to load and continue the trip to who knows what future. Many of those six million men that came in the doors at the North Pike Canteen would never return. And that was a grim reality. The short time in the canteen may have been for some the final touch with things that home and loved ones stood for. The room that had been crowded and noisy suddenly was very quiet, leaving women who were separated from her own husband, her betrothed, her brother, her son, to feel the real lonesomeness. And sometimes with tear-filled eyes, she slipped into the back room because she had already had that no, we regret to inform you. Military officials stated that North Platte's greatest contribution was as a morale booster for men a long ways from home. The generosity and concern shown by women wearing those aprons and the plain dresses was a gentle reminder of what they were fighting for. The simplistic warmth of the North Platte Canteen outdid other well-known canteens like the Hollywood Canteen or the North, or the um, New York Stage Door. There were times when men were not allowed to leave the train and at that time, there were the girls known as platform girls that would take the little baskets and go meet the train. And I did that once. But there was also the more, the less glamorous jobs of washing dishes. And I did that. There were stacks because you remember no paper products during the war. So there were stacks of plates, cups, bottles, pitchers, um, all needing to be washed, and we did them. And you know, these, these milk bottles that the men would carry out of the canteen onto the train, and the cups of coffee they carry out onto the train, then the, um, the conductors would collect those dirty uh, cups and bottles and the meet a train coming back to North Platte. And so then they then load the dirties and we'd have them to do over again. So it was a never ending cycle, but it was fun. Short time and that room had to be gotten ready again for another um, train coming in. Because those uh, trains, like I mentioned earlier, that one particular day that I wrote the letter, there were 18 trains, but it is noted that there had been up to 30 troop trains that would stop daily. Okay, those of us going back home to Shelton that night got on the train at 11 o'clock 
and we got into Shelton at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so it was a long day. And even when you're a teenager, that 22 hours made a long day and we were very tired. But because what we were doing, we felt repaid. North Platte became kind of a shorthand among servicemen everywhere. Mention North Platte, any place, Europe or the Pacific, and somebody's apt to have known what you were talking about. VJ Day, August 1945, ended World War II, but the canteen stayed open another eight months to welcome the men back home. Again, 51 months from the first day of operation until that very final day, April 1st, 1946. And on that last day, 15 trains came through and the ladies of Gothenburg welcomed those guests. But uh, Ray Wilson uh, was back in North Platte. She had been gone for a long period of time because shortly after the canteen opened, she became ill and she had to leave uh, the duties to somebody else. But on, the, on that last day, she was there and um, helped take down that sign. Railroad service ended 1971 and those railroad officials demolished that beautiful building in North Platte. And let me tell you, North Platte people were quite upset about it because they did it just kind of, you know, secretively. It just happened and North Platte didn't know about it. And today on Front Street, where that canteen Stood. This is what is there, a mini park with the historical markers. Many times I certainly wondered what the future held for the young man who ate a sandwich that I made or drank a cup of coffee that I poured. The young soldiers and sailors who enjoyed those egg salad sandwiches or cups of coffee or the birthday cake that my mom made are dying at the rate of 1,200 a day. And the older ladies who opened the canteen and kept it going are gone. And it's only a few teenagers like I was that are left with personal first-hand memories. The march of time has brought forth a generation for whom World War II is but a chapter in the history book and soon time will march, wipe away all personal recollections of the North Platte Canteen. But as long as the memory of one man or one woman remains that spirit of the canteen lives on. The North Platte uh, Lincoln County Historical Society has a display that's well worth your time. They tell the story in a very simple manner, but with displays and visual aids. And it's a, a great, stop if you haven't seen it. About two years ago at the Veterans Memorial Park right off the interstate in North Platte, they um, erected a sculpture of the canteen lady dedicated to the 55,000 volunteers. And that's uh, interesting to see. The war was hard to ignore in this area because we were close to two air bases, 
one in Kearney, and one here in Grand Island. We had the corn husker ordinance plan, the Hastings depot close. Many people employed the, and certainly our way of life changed from that of depression to more affluence. I live between Kearney and Grand Island, and the uh, sky over our farm was filled with airplanes coming and going. On August 17, 1943, the war came very close to my family and me because my dad and I were out in the we were irrigating corn, and we were watching the sky when we saw a plane fall, a B-17 fall out of the sky and crash on a farm uh, to the north of Wood River, right across from the Mennonite Church. A historical marker along Husker Highway was dedicated August 17th 2003, exactly 60 years to the day that that plane crashed, that commemorates the memory of the eight airmen killed in that crash. I saw that plane go down, and I saw that race burst of flames, and we visited the site of that B-17 crash. I never, I was only 15 again at the time. I've never forgotten what I saw or what I felt. If I've sparked your interest at all in uh, this Nebraska history, I want to recommend <laughs> the book once Upon a Town by Bob Green. Anybody read that yet? <laughs> oh, good. But it's a wonderful, wonderful story of the canteen. And just uh, pardon me for boasting, but I'm in this book, too, on page 19. <laughs> and then the... Uh, um, Nebraska Public Television made a wonderful documentary. Uh, it's an hour-long documentary that runs on public television uh, several times a year. And I'm not going to brag either, but I mean that. <laughs> Anyhow, you know, I just think this whole thing, this history of the North Platte Hat Canteen is such an amazing bit of Nebraska history. I'm, I'm gonna keep talking about it as long as I can. And I want you to spread the word about it too. It's such a great example of how we won the war and why we won it. It's a story that needs to be kept alive, and I'm gonna keep telling you about it. <laughs> and this is just a perfect opportunity for me to say I am so proud of the veterans in my family. You should be too. Look a veteran in the eye and tell him thank you. Anyhow, I have really enjoyed talking about the North Platte Canteen. You've been a wonderful audience and you made it very easy for me. And I thank you very much for asking me. How many were a student of Rosalie's? Hey. 
good. Are there any questions that you'd like to ask? Yes. Did you ever run out of food? Did you ever run out of food? That is the miracle. Here, remember that. that. I said that is the miracle of the North Pike County. It never ran out of food. You know, and of course, one of the reasons uh, they did have a little money, and if it wasn't brought, they could always go across the street and buy a few, what, you know, some more bread and some more peanut butter. But, it, no, they never ran out of food. Oh, yes. Well, we loaded it on the train when, when we went. Or you put it in the pickup or, you know, the trunk of your car. And you had these uh, big old A cases and they were, you know, safely. You could carry the eggs with you. You took the loaves of bread. And Well, you know, and of course, I wasn't Opal. <laughs> I didn't have to do the work. I was just a kid. <laughs> yes. Yes. You only have to talk a minute. <laughs> I've been for years trying to ask Cal to talk about his experiences during the war, and he says he can't do it. So this is his minute of fame. <laughs> oh, I wanted to say one thing to you. Uh, did I hug you the day I went through? Probably not. Well. <laughs> Oh, you were not over these? That's a shame, baby. I won't keep her. <laughs> That's all right. I probably won't make it to the next one. I think that was the 50th anniversary. I probably won't be there at the next one. Well, thank you. I give it back to you. I have to tell you one thing. Uh, I, um, I used to. Uh, before I went into service, I went with my mother several times when she would serve me and help her load the car and haul that stuff over there and everything. And I even played with a bunch of guys. We were waiting for the draft and, and uh, in the winter didn't have much to do. And so we got up, found six guys that hadn't been drafted yet. So we got a basketball team and we went to, I lived over by Wallace. And uh, uh, that was my home, well, Grainton, actually. And, uh, but we found guys up and down the county that were still waiting. And so we got up a tournament and uh, played a basketball tournament in Grant for, for the county. <coughs> so I was well acquainted with the canteen before I ever went into service. And then after I got into the service, I thought, that's something I have to do. I want to go through the canteen while I'm in uniform. Well, I got stationed in Texas, and then in Florida, and then back in Texas, and then in New Mexico. And then I went overseas, and I came back in California. And the two or three furloughs that I did have, when I came home, I came in from the west, and I left going west, so I never went through North Platte. 
always get off at Ogallala. <laughs> so um, finally, came back from overseas, and we had about 20 days furlough before we had to go back to California. And um, I thought, this, this is my chance. So there's uh, five enlisted men on my plane crew. I was on B-29 bomber. And uh, I don't know where the officers went while we were on this 20-day furlough. I think they stayed in California. But the five guys were from, I think, two or three from Pennsylvania, and one from Georgia, and one from D.C., Washington, D.C., and one from Detroit. And, and my radio operator was from Superior, and I was the farthest west of the whole bunch. So I had a sister in, in Omaha. So I, I thought, uh, I'll go down and see the sister and catch a train back to California. <laughs> so on the way back from, from the coast, I, I told the, these other five, four guys, five, what was it, five of them, because there were six of us, six enlisted men. And I said, if all you guys come to go through Chicago, coming this way, you're probably on UP, and you'll come through Omaha. Yeah, they figured they would. I said, well, get, you guys get together and get the same train in uh, Omaha, and I'll meet you there. <laughs> and it happened. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, got, I, went out, I caught a bus and went to Omaha to see my sister. Spent a couple of days. And uh, then I got on, when I got on the train, and sure enough, there's the rest of my crew. And uh, we went to California together. But I admit that I lived 300 and over 300, about 350 miles from Omaha. So I had to take that bus ride down there and make that, that extra 700 miles trip, that total 700 mile trip, just to get to go through the canteen. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice present. Well, yes. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. I wonder if you know how many servicemen were on one train, how many cars and how many were in a car. Do you have any idea? You have all of those big ones <laughs> that you don't know. I don't know. I know it's been years. <laughs> You know, maybe eight or so cars. I don't know that it'd be more than that. I thought there was some. Is another, are any other comments or questions? I'm just amazed at all the eggs, but when you think about the shortage of meat and that farms had chickens and eggs, that was uh, a good thing they did have. We have uh, time now to visit personally with Rosalie. Uh, she's on page 19 in Bob, <laughs> Bob Green's book that was written. Now, there's a copy on the round table back there, and there's one up here. It's, Rosalie is the first person that he mentions that he's interviewed uh, and, uh, in his book that came out about five, six years ago. You know, and that reminds me, um, uh, for you people that have been um, uh, members of this organization, you're, uh, uh, yeah, you're, oh, I'm lost now. But anyhow, you know, where I grew up, I grew up just south of the old Prairie Crip Dance Hall. Does anybody remember that? <laughs> well, and Verl Doherty was my neighbor, and Verl, was such an important part of this organization years ago. And it was Verl that I learned that you should write things down. You know, he was always writing stories. Well, I wrote this story. My memories of the canteen quite a few years ago, so just for my children, well, when Bob Green was um, getting ready to um, 
write this story about the North Platte Canteen, the editor of the North Platte paper put a little a bit in, in their paper that Bob Green wanted to make contact with anybody who had worked at the canteen. So I read that little clip and I immediately stuck my story in an envelope and sent it to him. <laughs> well, just in a few days I had a call from his office and said, hey, Bob Green wants to talk to you. And uh, so, uh, you know, it's just kind of funny. I was sitting here and thinking that my part in the canteen and telling you this story sort of relates back to Viral Doherty's influence and his influence in your organization. And so that makes us all circle. <laughs> a big circle, yeah. Anyhow. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Rosalie. One minute. Thanks, Mom. Um, <laughs> Brenda. As a veteran, I join with my brothers and sisters in asking you if you would pay back a little bit of what you feel you might owe us, go out to the VA hospital, sit down and listen to one of those old boys or those old girls, give them an hour of your time. It's worth so much more than you'll ever suspect. It's a small thing, but it's an incredibly huge thing. Hundreds a day of the greatest generation are going to their final, their final muster. And it isn't too much. Give them a little bit of your time. Show them your interest. And we, that would be our thanks. Right, Brenda? Would they like it? There will be no Voices of the Past program in December, but on that second Sunday night, in December and the night before, which are the 10th and 11th of December, the Stalling House is open, decorated for Christmas from six to nine, those two evenings. So we invite you to come out then. And then the second Sunday in January, John Hansen will be talking about uh, another era of his uh, uh, antique Christmas ornaments. We uh, kind of goofed him book the Plum Street Station for every Sunday in December, so we didn't have a chance to get it in then, but you might enjoy it more after that. So we meet here again the second Sunday in January, but the, the uh, Stolly House is open from 6 to 9 on December 10th and 11th on Saturday and Sunday evening, and we invite you to come there.